thank you very much, Taras. I, uh, we are uh, now moving at a different stage in our discussion. Our panel was announced as a round table. It functions so far as a panel with presentations and, and, and um, commentator. And now I guess we'll have our moment of the round table, which I would like to limit really to 15, 20 minutes. So the idea would be that um, I would ask maybe each of the uh, uh, m uh, members of the panel to speak uh, uh, up to three minutes in response to what they heard and also to comments made by, uh, by um, uh, Taras Kuzia. I would also, before we switch, and I guess we can go in the same order the way how the presentations were made, but uh, before we do that, I wanted to abuse a little bit my power of a, of a chair of the panel and uh, agree, uh, I don't know, 100% 100% with, with what Taras Kuzia just said about the need of the research and, and teaching and publication on, the, on contemporary Ukraine. So the issue that unfortunately is not addressed adequately either uh, here in Canada or in the United States of America or for that matter uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I also would like to add one more challenge uh, um, uh, to the to the Ukrainian studies again here in Canada, but uh, in in general in the world, saying that uh, the the project that was started by by the founding fathers turned out to be a very successful one for a for for a number of reasons, and one of those successes are in the fact that today if you have a good or even a semi-good article on Ukraine or a book on Ukraine, you can go into any publishing house, into any, the most prestigious journal and publish it there. When the institutes were founded, the, the, the publishing arm was created, the journals were created with the idea that you can't publish Ukrainian research anywhere else because it isn't considered to be a, 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 respect, uh, a respectable scholarship. So it changed now, and this po poses this, this kind of story of success poses new questions to the to the institutes where we are what our function is what what our publishing arms are doing what our journals are doing and again that's that, 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 that's something that um, maybe wasn't mentioned here and I, I really would like to be this uh, part of the discussion also in terms of discussion here of the panel but also uh, once we will be we'll start getting questions from the audience uh, um, so again, I'm, 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 I'm back to our round table mode, and I would invite Professor uh, uh, Lupul to speak up to three minutes on, on his thoughts of what, we, what he just heard. I think it's very significant. Is that loud enough? Yeah. Yes. I think it's very significant that the community wasn't mentioned at much or at all in what you heard. This may be because uh, people didn't understand what I was saying or it was irrelevant, I'm not sure. In any case, there it is. Uh, I would just simply remind everyone that without the community, there would have been no Kiyos. There's no two ways about it. Uh, that community made possible a member on the Board of Governors that I mentioned. It was the P&B club in Edmonton that submitted pressure, such as it was. I don't know exactly where it was, but there, there were people from the community in government, or else these people in the community had worked in the Progressive Conservative Party. And the Institute, I would remind you, was absolutely a political act in recognition of the fact that there is something called the Ukrainian fact in the country and the province. And they had heard from us. It wasn't people from Bullingdon where I was raised. It was right here in Edmonton. And it was the P&B organization which had en enormous respect as P and B organizations have, whether they are of Ukrainian background or not. Because that's the nature of the business and professional community. They are articulate, 
they are politically involved quite often, and they also hold power. And believe me, you can't get things in Ukrainian studies without power in what you might call uh, the uh, mainstream of our culture and institutions. So, I know it's very difficult to address this when you have panelists who are, I hesitate to say this, perhaps not even Canadian citizens. Nonetheless, this is a, a fact that we face. And people who come here uh, are members of the community elsewhere somewhere. They know its importance, its significance, and they're there to serve it. We have one here too, and in Canada as a whole. So why ignore them? You want them to buy your books? You got to talk to them. You have to advertise it. Take up w the issues of Ukraine. They are interested in the issues of Ukraine. Let me assure you of that. But they also live here as a group, and they have life as a group, and they have immense problems as a group. Trying to make sense of surviving as a group in a society that really marginalized them constantly. So this is all I would say off the top of my head. By the way, as a citizen of Ukraine, uh, uh, pardon, as a citizen of Canada, not, not at that Freudian slip. As a citizen of Canada, I'm very happy to be here in Strathcona, not in Edmonton, uh, where I understand that the University of Alberta is located, uh, and therefore I can become not only a Canadian, but a Strathconian uh, patriot. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are even have sensitivities in that uh, area of, of, uh, of differentiation, which some of us really like, uh, a few comments uh, on the basis of what I've heard. Uh, one of the things, first of all, we were also invited here uh, from various parts of the world in a setting, quite frankly, which I don't like. And why don't I like it from an intellectual point of view? Just stop and think about this. The amount of money that has been invested to bring people from all over the world, literally from all over the world, to speak for 15 minutes. I mean, literally. So what can one say in 15 minutes? One has to be very selective. Actually, in my presentation, and even some of the other presentations, there was a lot of comment about the Ukrainian community in the United States and Canada and its role in making everything possible. I mean, I don't know where this was absent in the presentation. This is a fact. We all know this. Uh, also, there was a comment about how after Ukraine came into being as an independent uh, country, uh, that actually uh, courses on Ukraine uh, and interest of students in Ukraine collapsed. Now, this may be the case, it was said here, but it may be somewhat of a myopic view uh, from the standpoint of Strathcona and, uh, and Edmonton. Because I can tell you that this is exactly the opposite that occurred at the University of Toronto in the 1990s and well into 2010, the general uh, course in Ukrainian history had every year between 35 and 40 students, which made it one of the largest courses uh, in Ukrainian history anywhere in North America. So, so much for the alleged collapse, it may be in one part, uh, but it's not necessarily in others if one is aware of that. And also interacting with, with the Ukrainian community when it is possible, it is done, and it has been doing, it, it has been done. There was an allusion uh, that Taras Kuzio made to the chair of Ukrainian studies and Boris Chesnevsky. We work very uh, closely with uh, James Temety and the Ukrainian uh, Jewish encounter, uh, very heavily engaged uh, in community affairs, in truly community affairs. 
And also another thing, we have been successful, which in drawing in non-Ukrainian foundations. One of the biggest supporters of the Chair of Ukrainian Studies is the Jackman Foundation in Ontario, which is one of the leading philanthropists at the University of Toronto and in general the arts. With regard to the need for, there was comment that uh, uh, um, Dr. Cusio made about the fantasizing of creating uh, five institutes and that uh, we should be thinking of political science. Well, this is exactly what the Institute of Ukrainian Statehood would be concentrating on and allowing uh, not only talking about the past evolution of Ukrainian statehood, but how it should function at the present. So this is where political science definitely uh, could become involved. And the other thing about combating uh, Russophilism and discussing whether what kind of subjects would be used, and one might say, why art and why music? This is really the battleground of Russophilism. There is no Ukrainian art and there is no Ukrainian music in the outside world. Unknown. But where was Malevich from? As one example. And where were some of the other great composers that are all described as Russian? This is, this is part of literally the combat and why these kinds of disciplines to show that Ukraine is at the level of any other culture in Europe and not just interested in classic history or folklore. And no one knows about this. First and foremost, Ukrainians. And not only Ukrainians in Canada and the United States, but in Ukraine. <coughs> so that's what I would comment in terms of my reaction okay. to some of the things that were said. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, so there are a lot of, <laughs> yeah. a, a lot of topics, and so I, I, I just think I, I will name a few of them. One, uh, I think it's been central to this, what role Ukraine played in Ukrainian independence for the development of Ukrainian studies here. And I would say, as I argue, that the Institute of the early 90s moved towards Ukraine, it also was moving in concert with the Ukrainian community here. That is, that became the major interest. And certainly in the terms of those endowments and monies that came in, there was great interest in dealing with Ukraine. By now, we had faced an entirely different issue, which is what is the existing Ukrainian community? And uh, in Edmonton and Toronto, we have uh, very prominently a fourth wave, which has made a whole new community. Uh, so the community has shifted in, in its interest, uh, and uh, Ukraine has played a role in it. Uh, then the issue of uh, the fields we dealt with. One thing I think we left out of the presentations was particularly for history, but not only, also for most social sciences, the move away from the national. That is, if when we began our careers, at least the three of us here, everyone accepted national history was a normal, a normal study. Uh, <laughs> trends changed, views of nations changed. They affected the way departments are structured. They affected the way uh, those studies go. So uh, I can give an example from Colombia. Uh, their attempt to form a chair of Polish history has had tremendous problems simply because history departments don't want this kind of history anymore in their mind, and that's, I think, influenced what we have. Then the issue of, of social sciences as opposed to what I, uh, might be called the three traditional fields. Uh, what, of course, I think that change away from the national has also affected sociology, anthropology, and political science particularly, where in many areas, when the Soviet political scientist retires at universities, uh, he or she, and usually he and has been in the retirements, is not replaced. That is, political science departments moved away from what might be called area studies. There are exceptions, but that has been a constant problem in continuing the field and, and supplying it, that there's no one doing anything dealing with that block in many places. The regional institutes, you know, and I mentioned Columbia, like the Harriman at Columbia play a role. And then I had mentioned differences between Canada and the US, and this is something I think we lost in this. If in Canada, there, there are in many universities, and particularly in the Prairie Provinces, the enrollments and the teaching has declined in numbers, that is not true of the US. 
and and not only because of community formation. That is, Kansas University began a Ukrainian program after Ukrainian independence. <laughs> Last year, University of Texas and University of Illinois hired uh, lecturers in Ukrainian language. Uh, Columbia's interest in, in Markov and Hagen talking about that came partially because I think Ukraine became independent, but it, it has taken funding from Ukrainian community, but not only the Harriman has put money in. I don't want to exaggerate the increase, but in the U.S., as, as opposed to Canada, uh, indeed the situation is somewhat better. And then finally, the, the what do we do with our definition of Ukrainian studies when, uh, in particularly the people in the social sciences, don't tend to concentrate on the area. There are now many more people who are involved in the field and study Ukraine because they go there now. You actually, you now have Pittsburgh doing anthropology on Ukraine, which you never had before. But the only way this could work, and Zenin brought this up, the problems of, of our generation. I also was rejected from the exchange and couldn't do my thesis research in the Soviet Union. So we, we did face that. Uh, but now you have all these people who do their work in Ukraine. And so suddenly fields like anthropology or sociology have people studying, which they would not have had before Ukrainian independence. Um, I will amplify somewhat what Frank has just brought up, uh, because Taras also challenged me uh, that why didn't the Institute somehow develop political science? And uh, there are a number of um, reasons. Uh, at the University of Alberta, there was no, no one interested in that. There was no in the political science department. There is no area studies at all at that time, or I don't think there's even today. Uh, all the political science uh, people were doing uh, theories and structures uh, that were uh, supposed to uh, solve problems for any nation, anywhere, or something, or in a comparative way. So it was not, you couldn't even get a discussion going about that, and at the Institute, we had uh, David Marples doing uh, uh, contemporary Ukraine, so at least we had something. And the only way we could encourage political <laughs> science is to uh, give grants to various uh, political scientists for specific projects, because we didn't have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, I, I actually was engaged in discussions about perhaps um, uh, getting uh, some uh, seed money uh, from the Kyus for a political scientist. We always had a political science uh, uh, on uh, uh, sort of in mind in creating any new positions, but new positions were never really created and uh, those discussions went nowhere. Yeah, um, just to, actually, Professor Plochy, um, the European perspective is actually in some ways in more interesting um, because uh, Britain, since the 1990s, has three readers, they used to be lecturers, now they're readers, in contemporary Ukraine, um, in uh, London, Birmingham, and Essex. Created by the, the British government, there was a big wave of creating new positions in areas that weren't previously covered when the USSR was around. This was, they were created around 96, 97. So Britain has three readers in contemporary Ukraine. But the biggest concentration of the study of contemporary Ukraine is Warsaw. There's at least 10 plus people working in two or three think tanks in, in Warsaw who write excellent materials, very objective as well on Ukraine nationalism um, based in, in Warsaw. I would just echo one f thing about teaching that Professor Magotchi said, that when I've, uh, I, I brought contemp contemporary Ukrainian teaching to the University of Toronto when I arrived in Canada after 2001. I launched courses there in 2002, 2003. I think it's wrong that where Professor Kahut talks about this. You can do things. You don't have to create, for example, a chair or a professorship. You can create lectureships and other, th other areas. And that was on the basis of getting small seed money from the Danilo Foundation, then from Zh Boris Vyshnevsky Foundation. And I had huge numbers of students. 
undergraduates and graduates. Um, because topics such as NATO, EU, Russia, Ukraine, Orange Revolution were sexy topics. And that was also true at George Washington University where I taught and had the same kind of numbers. On, <clears throat> you know, on the question of political science, I, I understand what Z Professor Kahoot said, but how does that excuse the fact that CIUS has only published one book on Ukrainian politics in 25 years? P Professor Harasima's book. One book. So you can maybe not have the positions, why can't you publish the material? Um, and why has the CIOS Journal since 2014 completely ignored what's going on in Ukraine? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I guess we are now ready to move into the, into the question and comments and answer period. And uh, I'm looking for those wonderful students. I'm, I'm discriminating against people with gray hair for, for now, for the next maybe five or ten minutes. So a, a, any people with hair and not gray hair? I, I, I'm looking around. Okay, so I guess, uh, yes, please, Ambassador. Gray hair. My name is Derek Fraser. I'm looking at this question from the point of view of a practitioner. As a former Germanist, Kremlinologist, and ambassador to Hungary and Ukraine, among other places, I would like to question uh, Frank, uh, Professor Sisson's remarks about the, decli uh, the decline of area studies. It seems to me there is a potential for a return to area studies. We have been faced with the problem in the last few years of being made fools of by Putin, by, of not misunderstanding, by not understanding the Middle East, and being not too sure exactly how to handle China. A good deal of this can be attributed to the fact that the structure of aerial knowledge, of our area knowledge that had been built up during the Cold War has been allowed to decline. And it seems to me that a good case can be made that Centers for Ukrainian Studies should consider the future requirements of the Canadian government, certainly the Department of Defense, and certainly the Department of Foreign Affairs. In addition, the Department of Defense used to finance uh, regional strategic centers at various universities. Calgary was a very good example. And a case can be made that the Canadian government should have an interest in supporting area studies. And it seems to me that what is required is a certain degree of uh, dialogue between centers of area studies at the various universities in Canada and the Canadian government in order to work out the needs of the Canadian government and also of other organizations such as the press for experts in certain areas in the world. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Messer. Uh, I think maybe I will collect maybe a, a couple of questions and comments and then we'll ask uh, the members of the panel to, to comment on them. If there are, uh, yes, David. Um, I'd just like to make a comment on um, my own department of history and classics and since I'm chair now I've got uh, pretty much a handle over the sort of statistics we've got. Um, it's been a fairly pessimistic morning to be honest, not only with the weather. Um, so I thought maybe I'd say something a little positive. Um, we have roughly 60 graduate students including the classics side as well. Almost one third of our graduate students are doing MAs or PhDs on either Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova, and the Belarus and Moldova applies to one student each. So in other words, just under one third of our graduate students are working on Ukraine. Most of them are from Ukraine, but there's also a significant contingent of Canadian students. So to me, if you look at the balance of the world and Ukraine's place in the world, it's actually far overrepresented among graduate students um, than any other area. And why is that? I mean, it's partly, I think, with uh, greatest respect, uh, John Paul Himke began this process 
of bringing graduate students from Ukraine to Canada. It was continued by me, although I also focus on Belarus as well as Ukraine. And it's continued now by the addition of Heather Coleman, whose recent work has also been based uh, on Ukraine. And between the three of us, uh, we have such an enormous load and we're able to fund these students. So I think that's a positive comment, that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Yep. Anybody else wants to make a positive comment? Uh, no, okay, then, uh, uh, button click, please. Just a, uh, a note about the Institute over the last uh, few years. Uh, we have, um, uh, I think, uh, f uh, um, activated um, a, um, a contemporary Ukraine studies program. It was headed by Dr. Harasimi until just recently. We held a number of events, um, one or two in which uh, Dr. Cusio participated in. Um, and of course, um, um, uh, you know, this is one of our areas of priority. In, in addition, uh, we've um, also, as of 2014, um, have um, instituted two um, postdoc fellowships um, focused on contemporary Ukraine or modern Ukraine. Um, we also uh, have been working closely with uh, Professor Hritsak in Lviv to, um, um, on um, problems of modern Ukraine and uh, I, I know that uh, through our, um, through my um, work in Hrek, although I'm a, that is the Holdemore um, Research and Education Consortium. We are, um, um, we're working not only on a historical problem, that is the Holdemore specifically, but we're addressing topics that are of, I think, uh, concern to the contemporary world. And one of them is an upcoming conference on um, the Holdemore and colonialism. And uh, so um, it's not as black as you paint it. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's possibly black and white, okay, or maybe gray. Uh, uh, Mark, please. Okay, I'm Mark van Hagen, and I uh, have a lot of hats, but one of them is I'm half in the political science department at Arizona State University for my sins, I suppose. Um, my other half is not, str str uh, strangely enough, in history these days, but in the School of International Letters and Cultures. That's another story. But on the topic of political science, um, I, I'll start with my own example. Uh, I gave a talk to my faculty seminar in political science on my own research project, which is about the creation of the Ukrainian state out of World War I and the revolution, 1914-1922. Um, the graduate students in international relations came. One junior faculty person who does Eastern Europe came. No senior person in any other field, any tenured person came to my talk. And I, you know, I'm, I'm used to being ignored by, by historians because I do Ukraine, but it was even more uh, appeal, uh, apparent that political science uh, was not uh, interested in the world outside of the United States. And that's part of our Las Vegas complex, which we'll come back to later, that what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, what happens in Ukraine stays in Ukraine, which is, of course, foolish and a, and a delusion. So I, I, I won't leave it at my example. I'll talk to a guy who is my pres presumed successor or possible successor as the, inter as the director of the Malikian Center, which is our Russian, Eurasian, East European centers at Arizona State. His name is Sam Green, teaches currently at King's College London. He's a political scientist with a British degree, UCL, uh, spent about, uh, I think, eight years at the Carnegie Moscow Center studying Russian politics. Just came out with a book on the protest movement. Um, for his talk two weeks ago, I was the only person from political science of a senior rank, plus the, the, poor, the poor junior person I just mentioned. Not a single person, came, even though his talk was a very creative adaptation of, of the field of political psychology from American polit political science. And Arizona State has two specialists on political psychology. Not one of them showed up to his talk. So again, if you don't do numbers and if you don't do US politics, 
too bad for political science. When I was at Harriman a couple of weeks ago for their 70th anniversary, a lot of another anniversary we can talk about, I spoke with Alex Cooley, who is a political scientist, who said he's given up on trying to get his colleagues in political science to care about area because political scientists care about numbers, they don't care about peoples, they don't care about their cultures, they don't care about, so it's not, you're blaming the victim, uh, or I think some, some sort of way, and, and political science has just abandoned us. It's not that we have abandoned political science. I started as an undergraduate at Georgetown in international relations. I read political science, or what was then called government and politics, and international politics, and now I really find it difficult to read anything that my political science colleagues write because it's all about numbers and graphs and charts and very little to do with the real world and real problems. But the situation in social science is, again, Putin is not Russia, political science is not social science. Thank goodness we have anthropologists and sociologists who are mentioned, who are doing wonderful work, who still believe in talking to people, who still believe in listening to their stories, who still believe in studying their languages and cultures, and can be our allies until political science comes back from its Putin, wherever it landed, in, in their area of almost irrelevance. And again, I, I have my own theory about this bit, that political scientists wanted, had sort of economics envy and wanted to make the salaries and have the potential influence that uh, uh, economics, ec economists had. And so they went into this rational choice, quantitative, I mean, for political science, the most important qualification is uh, multivariate, multivariated statistical analysis. That's what language means to them. Numbers, and so again, if, if numbers have overtaken people, we can expect, we cannot expect political science to come back to us soon. It's gonna take a, re a, re a reconstruction of political science before they can come back to us. Thank you very much. Uh, the situation in political science is not quite so uh, bleak or black and white. Uh, because uh, at the same time as the uh, main body of political scientists does uh, do the kind of uh, inscrutable and irrelevant, uh, apparently irrelevant work that uh, Mark von Hagen just uh, described, uh, there is a whole cohort of young uh, and American uh, academics, many of whom have no genetic uh, connection to Ukraine, uh, who are specialists in the politics of uh, Ukraine, and uh, I would think uh, I have in mind primarily people like Henry Hale uh, from George Washington University, uh, and they are uh, publishing and researching and uh, uncovering Ukraine uh, from a political science uh, point of view. And uh, in addition to those, there are, as Mark uh, said, uh, various uh, people in anthropology and uh, related disciplines that are doing the same thing uh, as well. So there is a, there is a cohort of scholars, uh, but unfortunately they're Americans and uh, we don't have very many uh, Canadians unless we include people like uh, Luke and Wei at uh, the University of uh, Toronto and maybe he should have been invited here as well. But it wasn't in the mic, so I will repeat it. So we have two more questions I am taking from Dominique Carell and Alexander Melnik. Then I will ask the panel to respond. We'll have an announcement regarding the lunch, and then we'll have our break. So, uh, Dominique, please. Well, Bogdan uh, already s said what I wanted to say, and I'm going to be speaking tomorrow, but I it's good to do we have provocative uh, comments um, but just mark when you say political science um, have run away from us or kind of uh, distance themselves from us well the us actually includes the political scientists who study Ukraine that is it's internal to political science I'll, I'll provide figures tomorrow, but just at the Danny Liu seminar in the last 12 years, we probably had 60 political scientists who actually do field work and generally don't publish in the inscrutable journals that you mentioned. So that's all I wanted to say now, and I'll provide more details tomorrow. Okay, thanks a lot. Alexander? 
Um, hello, just a brief comment uh, regarding the general context of Ukrainian studies and the possible directions and whether any of the speakers would maybe like to comment on it further. It seems to me in talking about the direction of the future development of Ukrainian studies, it is important to keep in mind the broader context in which this is taking place, whether it is political, cultural, economical. And I think uh, from my experience during this past year meeting a lot of people outside academia, I understand the economy in Canada and the United States is shifting radically. There's a generational sort of growth. Everybody in business circles talks about millennials and reaching out to them. But the, but the problem is also because of the nature of economic change, the institutions such as like classical universities coming, it's not just Ukrainian studies or humanities, the university itself is potentially becoming into much, much diminished role in the future because certain types of professions you no longer require university degree to perform the job efficiently. Having said that's one point. The other point is talking about Ukraine, again, related to this larger context, a lot of the people in this field that talk about importance of interdisciplinary teams for solving real problems. And Ukraine has a lot of problems, but Ukraine's problems are not just unique to Ukraine. A lot of problems that Ukraine experienced today, whether it was statehood, security matters, nation building, they apply to all across the world in different ways. And uh, and this and the inter interconnected world, what happens in Ukraine, Middle East, uh, I don't know, Africa, it affects the world at large. It, it has consequences for the US, it has consequences for Europe even to a larger degree at this moment. So it seems to me that is, the problem is an opportunity, an opportunity for Ukrainian studies to potentially engage itself in this broader context to mobilize different constituencies and to echo some of the comments that Professor Lupul was making beat within the Ukrainian community, the Canadian society at large, possibly government organizations, international structures, and potentially to do to both sort of make progress for the Ukrainian studies, push it in different directions, but also perform some service for larger community. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, now I will ask uh, the participants of the panel to comment, and I will ask to limit your comments to two minutes, given that we already out of time. I just want to follow up what David Marple said. I'm pleased since you, you know, there's been a talk here about optimism and pessimism. It's nice to know, to hear that there are as many students as there are in the Department of History and Classics. I also know who brought them there. It's people like Marples and Himka, and there are others. How long will they last? As you know, they are either retired or about to retire. That's one comment. We don't have replacements at the present time. Now, if the replacements are going to come, since he also mentioned the fact that a good number of them are now from Ukraine, then they should follow, in my opinion, the example of our own moderator, Sergei. I don't know how long you spent here on this campus before you left. Fifteen years, maybe. Well, that's a long internship, to put it mildly. However, it certainly wouldn't be mistaken. One wouldn't certainly be mistaken in urging perhaps at least six months if they have in mind to teach in, UK, in, in, in Canada. If they're going back home, it's irrelevant. So if you are a professor raising these future scholars, I would think if they intend to function in this country, then at least introduce them to the history of Canada, especially its political and cultural aspects. At least introduce them to that. Especially introduce them to the Ukrainian problematic. Uh, they need to know that these people do have problems and they appreciate someone to talk to them about those problems, especially, for example, at the present time and for the last decade at least. They should have been talked to about the nature of changing university life, especially university administrative life. 
because it's changed radically from when I was a director. I had freedom, precious freedom. It doesn't exist now. But there's too much worry about simply picking up the money and even getting students who are likely not very likely to remain here. Fine, but what about those who are going to remain? They should be aware of the situation in North America and especially in Canada. Or they'll have a very difficult time dealing with, as I said, the nuanced maze of the culture of academia when it comes to dealing with authority, whether it's political or on senior authority. They're cute and they're good. They know just how to fox minorities or ma non-mainstream interests. They make a specialty of it because you're so marginal. Uh, Bob uh, just uh, very briefly, it seems that w one uh, kind of thread that has been going on in this discussion is uh, concrete institutions, in this case that happen to uh, focus on the study of Ukraine and the rest of the world, including Ukraine. Uh, just because an institution is physically located in one place, that doesn't mean that it should not be concerned as part of its mandate the entire world. So uh, this may come as a surprise to some people who are focused on one particular geographic area, but I mean, if I heard correctly just now, why should we be concerned with students uh, who come here to the University of Alberta for a couple of years and then don't stay here and go back to Ukraine. Well, that's primarily what we should be concerned about if you're interested in sharing and expanding your expertise, uh, uh, part of transforming a society that needs to be transformed in a post-Soviet uh, post world. Uh, that, is part of the, that is part of our job as well, so, uh, you know, Institutions are in one place, their concern, if they're studying a particular subject, is worldwide. Okay, then to Ambassador Fraser's uh, point, I think yes, uh, the return to area studies is important. Where area studies institutes have been maintained, largely fields have been protected. I pointed out Columbia and the Harriman. The other would be, of course, the Monk Center at the University of Toronto, uh, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Without them, I don't think that the, there would have been a, a great change. At the University of Alberta, what that largely has meant, the existence of the Institute plus the Folklore Institute and the Worth Center for Austrian uh, Studies really is what constitutes the area studies community and that's a place it can be worked on. Then on the uh, strategies, one of the most important strategies have been postdocs. Uh, Bogdan Kleed brought up the postdocs here at University of Alberta. Um, this also, by the way, the Institute has had considerable funds which the Department of History students receive because they've been endowed at the Institute for carrying on work. But uh, we have experience uh, from the Yatsik postdoc at the University of Toronto. Uh, of the seven years they've been given, five of those people have gone on to tenure track positions. So uh, it does, I grant you that that was remarkably fortunate. I don't say that's going to hold, that is the difficult to get academic jobs, but by giving younger people in the field at least a chance, a year, two, or three, then we see whether they do fit in the field. Um, and there are also, uh, well there's postdocs at Columbia and other, other such places uh, that's, that they've been able to go to. And then finally, where it will maintain. I mean, I agree that, that uh, uh, one cannot do all the fields, but by the institutionalization that's been done for Ukrainian studies, in some ways when we brought up, Spain was brought up, but if we brought up Romania, say, there are more possibilities for maintaining <coughs> oneself, at least for a while, dealing with Ukraine with these postdocs and institutions created than I would estimate for more most places, mm -hmm. and I would I would hesitate to say even for Poland, 
that is in North mm -hmm. America. There are great problems for Polish studies mm -hmm. at the moment. So these institutions do create a certain structure. You know, does it fulfill all needs and will it fit with the teaching faculties remains as a problem. Um, what I, <coughs> I, I suppose I would like to reassure uh, Professor Lupul uh, that um, CIUS at least was uh, and is going to continue to be very closely linked with the community. Uh, the problem is that the community has changed. Uh, the P's and B's that were so powerful then are virtually non-existent now. And we have to refocus uh, our links with the community. At, uh, for example, when Ukraine, uh, uh, CIS's pivot towards <laughs> Ukraine was not only a natural outcome of uh, Ukrainian independence, but also a demand of the community. Uh, most of the money coming from, uh, uh, for endowments were for projects that de dealt with Ukraine and doing uh, not only studying Ukraine, but uh, uh, doing uh, work in Ukraine uh, in um, uh, such areas as this, uh, the Kowalski program for the study of Eastern Ukraine. Well, we established a whole <coughs> number of institutions in Ukraine. And this was a demand for the community because it was funded by uh, the, uh, the Kowalskis who gave $2 million for this. Uh, so that's also a community thing. And we've been working very hard with the community during the whole period. Uh, during this time. And then uh, the other uh, pivot to Ukraine was uh, uh, also uh, working with community and government. I mean, we had in the 90s for almost a decade a program for uh, sort of legislative uh, reforms in Ukraine. Looking back at it, you might think this was extremely naive. Uh, at that time, but the community was also demanding that we do something there. And we obliged. We uh, got a major CEDA grant and a subsequent CEDA grant and worked for about eight years of that. So the, there's, there's always a relationship with the community. And I think uh, servicing the community was and will continue be, to be a major uh, you know, uh, uh, avenue of activity f of CIUS. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. um, just on that particular final point, I, I, with friends in Boston, they say that's one of the major differences between URI and CIUS, because URI doesn't reach out to the community in Boston, at least what my Boston friend said, anyway. Um, but um, but uh, Professor Monhagen, you're right about the political science in America you're talking about, The Economist did two very detailed um, analysis of why American political science completely failed to see Trump coming. Completely failed. Um, and, um, and his success. They, they were writing him off all the time and then, well, they, in that sense, they are irrelevant from that discussion. On the question of Bogdan Klid's conferences, I personally think those, conf those kind of conferences are a waste of money. Um, why? Because they don't have any influence in the academic discussion. Unless you have the conference, unless you have people writing conference papers, then getting them published, whatever, doesn't matter, getting them published, they have no influence. What influence? Do what lasting influence do you have from those conferences? I'm sorry, you don't. Um, the problem we have today is that when Ukraine Studies was founded, there wasn't things like, you know, an interest in um, newspapers of for op-eds or blogs or social media. That didn't exist. Now it exists. And the battleground with Russophilia or Putinophilia, however you want to call it, is not just in academia, and I, people maybe missed the, 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 the number, but since 2014, nearly 300 academic publications and think tank publications have been published dealing with the Ukraine-Russia crisis, Donbass, Crimea. 300. Um, Ukraine studies isn't really part of that debate. And the problem we have, because Ukraine studies is dominated by historians, 
um, not political scientists, is that historians don't do, they go on TV and radio, as like Professor Sisson in Toronto did in 2014, but historians don't do blogs, don't do Facebook, and they don't do op-eds. In fact, in the whole of North America, there are only really four people doing op-eds on Ukraine. Karatnitsky, Motul, Marples, Kuzio. That's it. That's it. It's more than enough. Yeah. Um, to give you one example of the way things are going to have influence, and I'll finish on this point, the rather loath loathsome and unpleasant British academic Richard Sakwa, whose books are basically, the book on, on, on the Ukraine-Russia crisis is a kind of a Putin light. Um, he um, published a book, an e-book on Amazon on the uh, Euromaidan, Ukraine-Russia crisis, and it's had 30,000 downloads. That's influence. One, uh, 500 to 1,000 have been sold in hard copy, but 30,000 have been downloaded free of charge as e-books. We're not anywhere near that in Ukraine studies, but that's the way it should go. I think if those conference papers that Bogdan Klid talked about had been published as a special issue of the CIOS journal, I would have some, some sympathy, but they weren't. Well, you uh, continue to focus on Holodomor. Well, uh, thanks, thanks a lot. I, I'm really tempted to ask for one more positive comment now, but we don't have really time. So again, uh, let, me thank, le let me thank the participants of the panel. Thank you all of you for your questions and comments.